I'm also the answer to a trivia question, which some of you may have heard me relate this story before. Um, I was the first person in residence, the first scientist in residence on this uh, campus. Uh, I joined the center at the very end of 1992 uh, and preceded all of my colleagues in the basic sciences division into uh, what's now the Weintraub building by a few months because I was coming along with a lot of x-ray equipment, which they uh, uh, didn't want to deal with other than having it installed one time. So I was given the keys to this building in Jan right after New Year's in 1993. Uh, and uh, for about three months, I was by myself, just myself and my x-ray machines and the car carpenters who were finished the, finishing the building um, didn't even have a chair to sit on. I was sitting on a wooden crate that had the transformer for the x-ray machine, had no email, no telephone, nobody knew where I was, nobody could get in touch with me. It was probably the best three months of my entire life. Um, and I've been here in the same location ever since. Um, and so with that, it's a real pleasure to talk to you today. Um, and I'm, the title of my talk is Structural Biology at the Fred Hutchison Cancer Center. The shape of things to come. Um, and so I'd like to start off by pointing out uh, to all of you, and this is something that I'm sure you're all well aware of having heard a few of these talks, we are sitting right now at this point in time in the middle of multiple technological revolutions that are absolutely transforming biological research. And three of those revolutions are uh, our ability to inexpensively and very rapidly sequence entire biological genomes from very complex organisms. Uh, to conduct very rapid, very inexpensive gene editing in those organisms. In other words, to be able to precisely modify uh, the coding sequences of individual genes down at the level of a single base pair within those organisms. And then finally, the to topic of this talk, the ability to visualize large complex biomod biomolecules, the ability to actually see at atomic resolution the three-dimensional architecture and construction of the molecules that give us all life. So almost all of what you need to know about biology, certainly for this talk, is really presented in this slide right here before we get into the nuts and bolts. So as you all know, uh, there's this thing called the central dogma of biology, which simply states that all of the blueprints and instructions, the manual, if you will, for creating living cells and living organisms is contained uh, in the form of double-stranded DNA. Um, the human genome is comprised of DNA and it uh, uh, consists of about 3 billion base pairs or letters worth of instructions. Um, those blueprints and the information within are transcribed and turned into messengers uh, uh, in the form of RNA. And then that information is further translated and turned into protein molecules. And proteins are really what keep me awake at night. I've loved them ever since I first heard about them as an undergraduate even in high school. Um, and the reason that they're so interesting is they're fabulously interesting in complex molecules. And once they're made, according to the blueprints encoded in DNA, um, proteins do most, certainly not all, but most of the work in the body. They catalyze or speed up all the chemical reactions required to keep your life going. They create structure and form. They act as motors for movement uh, and for creating force. Um, and finally, they transport material and information between and within cells and around the body. And that's just some of the things that uh, some of the types of work that proteins do. So in order to carry out all these those myriad functions, um, proteins fold into very precise three dimensional architectures or structures and that allow them to function. And shown here are just three types of proteins, all of which are absolutely essential to uh, 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 life to all of our lives. Um, Shown on the left is the three-dimensional fold of a protein called hemoglobin, which is responsible for picking up oxygen in your lungs and then carrying it around your body and your bloodstream, finally dropping it off throughout your tissues. Shown in the middle is a protein that's also found in your bloodstream called factor eight. And this protein is absolutely essential for your ability to uh, staunch the flow of blood when you injure yourself. It's a clotting factor. And if you have mutations in this protein, you have a disease called hemophilia A. This particular structure, which I will come back to, was solved in three dimensions at atomic resolution uh, in our lab back in 2008. Then shown on the right is a, a structure uh, uh, of an antibody. So this is basically, uh, yet again, protein that circulates in your bloodstream uh, that's involved in warding off infections, in recognizing and binding to foreign uh, uh, molecules, foreign cells, invaders, and stimulating the initial stages of your immune response. 
So these pretty diagrams that I'm showing you here are actually cartoon representations of much more complex underlying structures. Basically, uh, uh, these individual ribbons represent a chain of amino acids that fold up into various shapes. And the underlying structures uh, are actually comprised of uh, uh, bonded groups of atoms, um, many atoms that make up these molecules. And the 3D structures of these proteins are held together by bonds and interactions between individual atoms found within the interior of these proteins. And to just give you a sense of scale, this protein right here, factor eight, again, it's a clotting factor, is made up of exactly 24,160 atoms arranged uh, into multiple protein chains, uh, chains of amino acids that fold up into a precise three-dimensional architecture and allow this protein to play out its role uh, assisting in the coagulation of blood when you injure yourself. Um, so the number of structures that have been solved uh, over the past decades, the number of protein structures and large biomolecular structures that have been solved has grown rapidly over the past 50 years. And until recently, it's been almost entirely due to the use of a technique called X-ray crystallography. So shown here is just a diagram showing the total number of structures uh, 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 solved by year, starting back uh, in the uh, uh, late 60s, early 70s, and on into the 80s. And to give you a point of reference for my own career, I entered graduate school in 1985. And at that point in time, it was possible for a new graduate student to go to the university library and photocopy the papers describing all of the important uh, uh, crystallographic structures of proteins in a single afternoon and put them into a binder. And then, I entered the Hutch in 1992. Um, this was, I, I actually got my job here in response to a targeted job search um, that was initiated by Basic Sciences to bring structural biology as a discipline to Fred Hutch. And uh, Paul Neiman at the time, in a document to the board describing why they wanted to bring this particular technology here said that structural biology is central to modern biology. Its absence from the center would be a serious deficiency for the future. Its presence would significantly enrich and expand the quality of our scientific program. So um, I came here in 1992 as a result of that uh, faculty search. Um, and then now here we are in 2021. So my career as a research investigator has basically spanned this exponential growth in the number of three-dimensional atomic resolution structures of proteins that are available. It's been an incredibly exciting and fascinating ride, as you might imagine, over the past almost 30 years now. So X-ray crystallography, this is the technique that has led up until very recently, just the past five years, uh, to the vast majority of structures that we have of biological molecules. And to tell you how this works, it's an incredibly linear process which in which each step must be successfully uh, conducted. And if any one of the steps fails, then you end up not solving a structure. So the steps basically are first off, you have to make lots of the protein that you want to study and wish to see the structure of. You typically do that by expressing the protein in some sort of a cellular uh, uh, incubator system. It could be bacteria or yeast or insect cells or human cells, but you grow up some biological uh, cell source that expresses the protein and makes lots of it. And then you go through a process in the laboratory of purifying the protein from the big mixture, the big gamish of proteins that come out of those cells until you have an extremely pure sample of the protein. And the types of volumes and amounts that we're talking about is you might start with several liters of these cells. And at the end, you might end up with a single tube with uh, 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 well less than one milliliter, hundreds of microliters of very pure protein, basically just a really large drop of fluid containing a concentrated solution of purified protein of interest. Once you have this material, the next step is to actually take that liquid solution of the protein and carry out some chemical tricks to force the protein to form crystals, to crystallize. So shown here is a picture of crystals of purified protein residing in a drop of surrounding liquid. And the reason why we grow these crystals is that they act in a manner to uh, align millions or billions of copies of the molecule in a precise arrangement that can be placed in front of an X-ray beam. And so we shoot X-rays through crystals of protein and we collect uh, 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 scattering data, X-ray scattering data from those crystals using an X-ray detector that's located up here on the third floor of the Weintraub lab. 
we then do some math that we don't need to worry about and basically produce a three-dimensional map that corresponds to the positions of all the atoms and all the amino acids in the protein. We visualize the structure and then we model atoms into uh, that map using all of our knowledge about how proteins are constructed and how they fold to accurately represent the position of all the atoms in this uh, uh, three-dimensional map of the molecule. And then finally, we describe the structure turning this three-dimensional uh, uh, array of atoms that, com that comprises the structure into these pretty ribbon diagrams that sort of show the overall shape uh, of the protein. So again, this is a very linear process starting with making the protein, crystallizing the protein, collecting x-ray data, solving the structure, and every step has to be achieved successfully. And it's a process that if you're lucky, it takes a few weeks. Um, and if you're unlucky, uh, it takes years. But as long as you get the structure in the end, you're still lucky in the end. And sometimes it just never, ever works. There are proteins that simply don't crystallize. And I will get to that point in just a little bit. So this is just highlights of 27 years uh, at the time I gave this talk, now coming up on 29 years of X-ray crystallography at Fred Hutch, just out of my lab. Uh, we've studied proteins that are involved in binding to DNA and carrying out a process called gene editing. We've studied enzymes involved in energy production inside cells. We've studied enzymes involved in the synthesis of new uh, uh, DNA. We've studied, as I've mentioned, proteins involved in blood clotting, proteins involved in viral uh, uh, restriction, and we've studied a lot of uh, computationally designed designer proteins, basically proteins designed in a, by a computer program, and then we make the proteins and crystallize them and validate their structures and then do interesting things with them. This is just one lab's worth of work. I will mention that we, over the years, have been joined by other structural biologists. Roland Strong is here in the division and his study, his laboratory focuses on uh, proteins of the immune system, as well as proteins of interest uh, for vaccine development. Um, over in the vaccine and infectious disease division, Leo Stamatados and Marie Panchera uh, uh, work on crystallography of viral proteins, again, mostly with an eye towards vaccine development. So, Eric? yes, Eric? question, please. One question just came through. How uh, do you know when you have the right structure? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there, without going into details, there are really uh, uh, accurate um, and uh, 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 very precise computational and mathematical tools that compare the model that you build with the original x-ray data and provide you with statistics uh, that allow you to have confidence that you've built the correct structure. Um, and there are a number of things that go into the confidence with any accuracy of that structure determination. Um, and it mostly boils down to the quality of the resolution of the image that you're building into. The sharper the map and the more details that are in the map, the more confidence with which you can build the structure. But in the end, it's a mathematical analysis uh, uh, that gives you confidence that the structure is correct, combined with the fact that there are certain features of protein structures which you should always see regardless of the protein. And if you deviate from those, then you know that something's not right. So it's a really good question. It's the topic of an entire semester's worth of uh, a class on, on solving structures. Really good question. All right, thank you. Yep. All right, so having told you that we can solve three-dimensional structures, atom by atom of proteins and see everything about how they're put together. The obvious question that you should all be asking yourself is, well, that's great, but uh, what good is the three-dimensional structure at atomic resolution of protein? What can you do with it? Um, and there's a number of things that make this incredibly important. The first is for any given biological molecule, uh, proteins usually in my case, you, once you're armed with that structure, you can start to understand and then test exactly how they work, how they carry out their function. Um, if it's an enzyme that speeds up a chemical reaction, you can look and see exactly how it does so. If it's a protein that's involved in carrying oxygen around your bloodstream, you can look at, at that using the structure as your guide to understand their mechanism. And that's perhaps the most fundamentally important aspect of structural biology is just a much improved uh, understanding uh, biophysically and structurally how the proteins do what they do. You can also take those proteins once you know their three-dimensional structure and you can redesign them in order to alter their properties. You can make them more stable. You can make them 
uh, have better uh, properties and solution, be more soluble. You can do all sorts of things to them in a process called protein engineering. And for that, you need to know their original three-dimensional architecture and all of the atomic contacts that uh, allow them to uh, fold up into their given shapes. And then finally, uh, uh, you can create small molecules that inhibit or alter their function, i.e. you can use those structures to create drugs, usually drugs uh, that block their function. So there's a whole uh, uh, field that's called uh, structure-based drug design. And I'm going to go into that in a tiny bit more detail because this is of considerable interest uh, to any medical center, including in particular a cancer center. So the basic idea is that imagine that you've got some protein. In this case, I'm showing you the structure of an enzyme made by a bacteria that that bacteria re absolutely requires for its growth and infectivity. And somewhere in that enzyme is what's called the active site. It's the region of the protein where the chemistry actually happens. It's the critical part of the protein where its function is, is realized. In this case, speeding up some reaction. Armed with the three-dimensional atomic structure of the enzyme and of the active site uh, uh, inside the enzyme, it's possible to design a small molecule that fits very uh, well uh, into the active site, binds there extremely specifically and very, very tightly. And that's basically the lead for the eventual creation of hopefully a small molecule that you can take in the form of a pill. Um, that will block this enzyme's activity, and in this case would act as an antibiotic. Um, and then once you have this, this initial structure, this initial model, there's a whole process called medicinal chemistry where you take your initial uh, lead and then you build it out and make it absolutely perfect for filling up every crack and crevice inside this active site until it, that molecule is absolutely specific for this protein and this binding site within this protein and basically avoids all other proteins in the body and therefore sort of avoids side effects. So this is a field that has been uh, uh, available uh, and, and used for now decades. Um, and using a structure-based drug design, um, you can create all sorts of molecules with various biological activities and physiological medicinal outcomes based on what protein it is that they bind to. So just to give you a feeling, uh, here are four chemical structures of four drugs uh, in some random order. And down here is a list of which one is which. Uh, and so stare at those for just a second and see if you can guess which one is the erectile dysfunction drug, which one is the anti-cancer drug, which one's the antibiotic, and which one is the narcotic. The key point being here that you look at these small molecules, they, can't, they definitely have very different chemical structures, very different groups of atoms, but each one has been precisely created to bind to a specific binding site in a specific protein, and by so doing carries out a very specific biological function. So here's the answer to the, uh, the pop quiz. Um, um, heroin is the one uh, 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 to the upper left. Viagra is this one, the anti-cancer drug Gleevec is this one, penicillin is this one. You'll notice that not all of these were actually created using structures of proteins uh, to build them. Obviously heroin uh, uh, is a natural product of, an opi of uh, uh, poppies, comes out, is derived from opium. Penicillin uh, was initially uh, isolated out of funguses, um, whereas Viagra and Gleevec were both generated uh, uh, in a computer and then using medicinal chemistry, using structures of the target proteins to guide the development of these drugs. But for the ones that are naturally occurring drugs, structural biology has since allowed investigators to understand the precise interactions of these two drugs with their protein targets in the body. So I wanna go on just a tiny bit more and tell you a quick little vignette about the development of Gleevec and how structures uh, have played into that. So Gleevec, again, is an anti-cancer drug. Um, and it specifically was developed uh, uh, to treat chronic myelogenous leukemia. So just to remember your, uh, remind you about leukemias, um, this is the hematopoietic uh, uh, pathway by which all the cells in your bloodstream develop, starting with an initial blood stem cell that differentiates into all the different types of blood in your bloodstream, red blood cells that carry oxygen, platelets that are involved in uh, 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 wound healing, and then all of the various immunological cells, white blood cells that are involved in targeting invaders. 
Now, in normal peripheral blood, you have a distribution of cells that look something like this. The little pink circles are your, are your red blood cells, and then these larger cells are your uh, uh, white blood cells, your immune cells. And in leukemic blood, you start to see stains that look more like this as you develop a, a hematological cancer and one particular type of cell starts to grow in an out of control fashion and dominate your bloodstream. And the, and the symptoms of this are you become extremely anemic, you start to have issues uh, 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 healing wounds and you start to have issues with proper function of your immune system. So in the case of chronic myelogenous leukemia or CML, many cases of CML, the underlying genetic cause is a defect where a piece of one of your chromosomes, chromosome 22, accidentally gets broken off and then it gets stitched on to a different chromosome, chromosome number nine. So you get this abnormally long chromosome here that's actually chromosome nine and then it just runs directly into the end of what used to be chromosome 22 and then you get an abnormally short chromosome here so it's called a translocation it got a piece of a chromosome got broken off and reattached to chromosome nine and it turns out in chronic many forms of cml that the result of that genetic defect is you make basically a, an unnatural undesired hybrid protein which is encoded by the very end of chromosome nine and then continues on to coding sequence in the DNA from the beginning of that translocated piece of chromosome 22. So you get this protein that normally would not exist in a normal cell, but in a cell where those two pieces of chromosomes have been stitched together, right at the site where they're spliced to one another, you get instructions that encode this sort of Franken protein that should not exist. And it turns out, as luck would have it, in one of the most unlucky of uh, uh, genetic events, this protein is fully active and it has the, process, uh, the properties of acting as an enzyme that produces molecules that signal the cells uh, to just start growing and dividing unceasingly. This basically is now uh, the equivalent of just a green light uh, to cells, that it's time to grow and not stop no matter what. So, that's incredibly unfortunate from the standpoint of developing CML, uh, but it's very fortunate from the standpoint that it is one of the very rare cases where a cancer is corresponds to the presence of one single pro aberrant protein that's in those uh, cancerous cells. So this is an immediate drug target by virtue of the fact that if you can shut it off, you could basically block the, the growth and uh, uh, propagation of those cells. So the active site of this unnatural enzyme is located right here. And basically uh, uh, this uh, compound that's now known as Gleevec is a tight binding compound that just sits right down in this active site and just shuts this enzyme off altogether. So this was the first genetically targeted cancer treatment. It's incredibly effective and specific because of the fact that this particular type of cancer is caused by a single aberrant protein. Um, and it's the topic of a book that's a really excellent read. Uh, if you're into reading uh, uh, science at a highly understandable level, the, this book, The Philadelphia Chromosome by Jessica Wapner is a really excellent read describing how this all came about. Any questions about that uh, before we go on? If any, are there any questions in? If not, I'll just continue. Um, yeah, we don't have anything yet, Barry. Great, well, feel free to type those questions at any point. So hopefully I've, uh, uh, you all sort of understand, uh, uh, again, that 3D atomic structures of proteins are good for a lot of different things. Um, I told you a quick little story about the creation of small molecules that inhibit or alter their function uh, as a result of having those structures. Another thing that my lab is particularly involved in is engineering proteins to alter their properties or to create new properties using structures of those proteins as a guide. So to give you an example, here are two crystal structures that were solved in my lab within a year of one another. These are two proteins that are found in a mi microbes. One is found in a bacteria called rast a rastamonid. The other one's found in a fungus called ophiostoma. And these two proteins basically are just involved in some genetic processes that are important to those particular uh, uh, microbial species. But it turns out they're both DNA binding, DNA targeting proteins. And we, uh, uh, after solving their structure, we're able to leverage these structures uh, and combine these proteins to create something that's called an engineered gene editing protein. So this is now a protein, which if you make it, if you engineer it, it contains 
parts of both of the individual proteins now put together in a single protein chain, and it can be used to direct cor uh, corrective activities or altering activities to specific stretches of DNA sequence and chromosomes. And this is a big deal. Basically, these proteins can do the same sort of thing that CRISPR-Cas9 does, for those of you who have heard of CRISPR. It's a type of gene targeting uh, system, but with act, uh, uh, properties that are really useful for certain applications. So armed with these two crystal structures, we were able to make these artificial gene targeting proteins. We were then able to patent uh, the creation of them and the use of them for gene targeting uh, processes. And that patent was uh, 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 filed in 2014. Um, and it's now licensed from the uh, center by a company called Bluebird Bio, um, uh, who pay licensing fees every uh, year to Fred Hutch to be able to use and develop these for basically gene therapy applications and for genetically engineering cells for cancer immunotherapy. So three-dimensional structures of proteins allow you to, uh, to engineer proteins to, in order to put them to new uses in cells for biotechnology and medicine. So we're going to make a big switch now. We're going to move away from crystallography. And the reason that we're going to move away from crystallography is that it has a huge limitation. And the limitation is that crystallography is good up to a certain point for solving structures. But at some point, proteins get too large and too complicated um, and too uh, flexible because of that size to be able to grow crystals. So for example, this clotting factor that I told you about, we solved the crystal structure of this. It took us years to do it, seven years. The crystals were never very good, but we managed to solve this structure. And the reason why we struggled is that this protein is just about as big and as complex as X-ray crystallography can handle. It's, it's a protein that really is difficult to crystallize because there are so many moving parts distributed around such a large molecule. Again, there are 24,160 atoms in this protein, and it was just very difficult to solve its structure. So another protein that we worked on for many, many years is an antiviral restriction factor. It's called DRD5. We worked on it for quite some time, as well as uh, 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 this and cousins of this protein, trying to get a crystal of any of them. And so this protein is about three times larger than factor eight. It's got about now 76,000 atoms in it. And just after years of trying, this protein and all of its uh, closely related cousins just absolutely refused to crystallize. It just was impossible to do so. So an enormous amount of work went in over the years for absolutely zero return because purifying a protein just really doesn't buy you anything in terms of getting results. So that leads me to the revolution that is now happening that I'm gonna end this talk with, uh, uh, which is embodied in this uh, really cool graphic from a science or nature article published about six years ago now, the revolution will not be crystallized because there's a new, there's a new method in town. It's called cryo-electron microscopy or cryo-EM. And the key point here is that no crystals are required. We no longer have to crystallize the protein. We just have to purify it. And we don't even have to purify it to absolute homogeneity. You just have to sort of do a decent job of purifying it. And then you simply put those molecules down on a grid, a small little piece of film, put it in this, inside this camera. And then as the old Nikon commercial used to say, you just point and click. You're just taking pictures of the molecule and you're taking pictures of the molecule in a variety of different orientations, and then just directly visualizing the three-dimensional structure of the protein simply by putting a ton of pictures together, many hundreds of thousands or millions of pictures together into a final image of the protein. So people have been trying to pursue cryo-EM as an alternative for crystallography for many, many years, okay? And one example, that has been out there for a long time where people have tried to uh, look at the structure uh, uh, is something called the spliceosome. So the spliceosome is a molecular machine that's found in all the cells of your body. And what it's uh, responsible for is it stitches together or splices RNA molecules that are made in your body. It's absolutely essential. And if you have defects in RNA splicing, uh, those defects are associated with most, if not all, cancers. And uh, Rob Bradley here in our division 
is one of the leading studiers of the relationship between RNA splicing and defects in splicing in human cancer. But for this talk, the thing to me mention is that this beast is huge, is absolutely enormous. A spliceosome contains 37 proteins, four RNAs, plus a lot of other proteins coming and going during its life cycle. It's got at least a quarter of a million atoms at, at a minimum uh, in order to be active. And so it's impossible to generate in large amounts. It's absolutely hopeless to crystallize. You'll ne nobody has ever gotten anywhere trying to make and crystallize this protein. So people tried studying it for many years using electron microscopy as an alternative. And studies were produced and published in the 1990s and in the early 2000s, which produced images that look like what I'm showing here. Okay, so this is the spliceosome circa early 2000s. Um, and you can see basically little features that they gave various sort of uh, anthropomorphic terms, an arm, another arm, the head, the body. Um, so crystallographers like myself were watching these papers come and go for quite a, many years. And we just dismissively described all of these studies collectively as blobology. And we had concluded for a lot of years that cryo-EM was an interesting idea, but it would never actually generate the types of detailed uh, 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 information about atomic resolution structure that you actually need. So we just felt that this was hopeless. And the game changed in 2015, where all of a sudden new cryo-EM studies came out uh, in which they just pointed and clicked, took lots of pictures of the molecule, and all of a sudden, lo and behold, you had atomic resolution structures, atom by atom, quarter of a million atoms of every last subunit in the, in, in the spliceosome in enormous detail, showing all the details in a single sudden paper of how the spliceosome works. It was an extraordinary moment of, oh my God, look what, what they can do now sort of thing. So how was this possible? How did cryo-EM suddenly become so powerful so quickly? Well, cryo-EM is revolutionizing structural biology, and it's brought to you by three uh, 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 advances that happened one on top of the other. The first is that all of a sudden, uh, companies and physicists created much more powerful electron detectors that just collect much clearer images. So just improvements in detector technology. The second is that new computational algorithms uh, were generated to sharpen those images, to take the fuzziness and the blurriness out of those images. And then finally, additional new computational algorithms were created that cluster together images of different orientations uh, and forms and just sort of throw away all of the bad images of contaminating molecules. So it was two advances in computer algorithms and one advance in detector technology that all of a sudden allowed images to be generated that went from being blobs to being three-dimensional atomic resolution structures uh, very quickly. So as of uh, uh, January 2020, uh, Cryo-EM is now outpacing crystallography in terms of determining new structures. Um, and the structures that are being determined are structures that we could never touch, never get a look at using crystallography. So it's an absolute and utter game changer for structural biology and that and it is the wave of the future. So Fred Hutch is far along and absolutely all in in uh, Cryo-EM. We have a brand new cryo-EM facility, which cost us about $4 million sitting down in the E level of the Thomas building, um, where we have two microscopes. We have this guy, which is about seven feet tall, called a glacios microscope. And then across the hall, we have a smaller screening microscope um, that basically allows people to get their initial looks before they get to this. And then if you really want to go for it, uh, you can send your uh, samples down to the Pacific Northwest Cryo-EM Center, the PNCC in Portland, Oregon. It's right next door to the Knight Cancer Center, where they have four of these bad boys uh, or bad girls um, uh, lined up in a center. Uh, these are called Titan Krios microscopes. They are, uh, as shown here, relative to a six foot tall person shown here. They're about 12 feet tall. Uh, and they have four of them for a cool $12 million each. And this is one of three national facilities scattered around the country where these sorts of microscopes are available for free and public use, um, courtesy of us, the taxpayers. We're also along in terms of uh, building up the necessary uh, expertise. Uh, uh, one year ago now, uh, we welcomed Dr. Melody Campbell uh, uh, to 
through the faculty in the basic sciences division. She was recruited here uh, as a result of an international search for a leading cryo EM uh, expert. And Melody came to us from UCSF. She has extensive training in cryo EM, both as a graduate student and as a postdoc. And some of those papers that I mentioned that brought the revolution to us, particularly the computational papers that figured out how to make the, the images much clearer, were uh, uh, published by Melody. She's an absolutely brilliant practitioner of cryo-EM. So she published as a graduate student and then as a postdoc seminal methodological advances that have led to this revolution. They are considered must reads by anybody who wants to get into this field such as myself. Well, Melody studies, um, are how cells, particularly uh, specifically mammalian and human cells, communicate with the outside world and understand their surroundings and their contacts using cell surface proteins called integrins. Um, and these are proteins that really were not under well understood until cryo-EM stu structures of them became available. Integrins are implicated in nearly every step of cancer progression from primary tumor development to metastasis. So Melody brought with her not only incredible expertise uh, in cryo-EM and is now responsible for running, setting up and running and managing our cryo-EM facility, um, but she brought with, us to, with her a type of biological research that's a really outstanding addition to cancer immunotherapy research at Fred Hutch. So we're incredibly excited to, to have her here. Um, uh, old crystallographers such as, my, as myself certainly don't want to left behind, so we're also now learning cryo My own lab uh, has finally gotten to uh, enjoy the fruits of this revolution, so returning with my last two slides to this uh, protein that we worked on for so many years, uh, in less than one year, we were able to basically catch this protein in the act of uh, binding DNA and setting itself up to act as an antiviral restriction factor. Um, and shortly after that, uh, uh, in, in less than a year after we started trying, we were able to solve the structure of this massive protein, something that we had wanted to see desperately for many years. So shown on the left spinning around is the electron density map of the DRD5 protein with DNA molecules shown in those bright green and red colors bound to the enzyme. Shown on the right is the corresponding model of the protein in those pretty ribbon diagrams again. So this was just published uh, last year online and is going to be on the cover uh, of the June issue of uh, Structure from Cell Press. Uh, it's our first cryo-EM structure. Uh, it is uh, uh, something that has uh, 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 allowed us a glimpse at a type of molecule that we had wanted to see very badly for a lot of years. All right, so if I can manage to advance past the movie. So in conclusion, why is this all so important beyond the biological implications and the things that you can learn as a biochemist? So this new approach in technology, um, it isn't simply going to allow people with really highly specialized training to solve more complicated structures. It's going to eventually democratize structural biology and it's going to enable anyone who has a desire to see a structure as part of the research to accomplish that goal. The entire field is getting more and more simple and accessible to biologists of all training. Um, and it's going to be exciting to see that happen. So finally, I just wanted a couple of quick big thank yous uh, for all of this. Um, so structural biology has been incredibly well supported at the center from the early 1990s uh, on uh, with enormous investments, both for X-ray crystallography and now for cryo-EM. So center leadership present and past, including Tom Lynch, Gary Gillen, Bruce Clerman, um, Sue Biggins in the basic sciences division in particular, uh, our, our, the director of our division and the board of directors all were uh, uh, instrumental in, uh, uh, getting this uh, in getting this to happen. Uh, and then the entire Fred Hutch community, uh, including and specifically all of yourselves, for just being an amazing place to pursue science. I've been here my entire academic career once I finished my postdoc. Uh, I would never leave. Uh, they will drag me kicking and screaming uh, out of the place uh, if, they, if I'm asked to go before I want to. It's just an amazing place to be rich science. Uh, and I thank you all for uh, playing a role in that. And then finally, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, at least show you my own lab and the people that have carried out all this work. Here's the pandemic version from last summer and the corresponding unmasked but still distanced and outside summertime version. We're very much looking forward to June 9th when we can uh, throw off our masks and celebrate uh, together. 
Um, and with that, I just wanted to uh, uh, offer you one final cartoon with how I run my laboratory. You can read it on your own time and thank the NIH, the Gates Foundation, University of Washington, New England Biolabs, and, and especially Fred Hutch uh, for uh, 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 support over the years uh, for all this. And with that, um, I'm all done. Happy to take questions. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time uh, this afternoon, Barry. And thank you also for highlighting uh, some of the other scientists here at uh, Red Hutch who you work with. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, so first question we have here. Um, which of the highlights over the past 27 years have been the most exciting and transformative for you? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, every structure is near and dear to my heart. Um, I would be hard pressed to pick my favorite one, but I will say my absolute favorite structure that's ever come out of the lab um, is one is uh, I actually showed it and it's actually on this slide right here, as a matter of fact, uh, this is a structure of something called a tal effector uh, and it's part of that engineered protein that I mentioned that we patented and licensed. Um, and I simply love this structure because it's beautiful. No other reason except I just think it's the coolest looking structure. It's a protein that winds around the double helix of the DNA over multiple turns. And I just always, the first time I saw it, I fell in love with that structure from uh, uh, just an aesthetic standpoint. Uh, just so uh, uh, I, you know why I've got this credit here, um, this uh, was supposed to be a cover uh, uh, on Science Magazine. Uh, we. Uh, and we generated this image uh, courtesy of this fellow right here, John Bogdanov. He's the older brother of our collaborator. Uh, and he's one of the lead illustrators at DC Comics. So we sent him a picture of the structure, asked him to make us a cover image. And this is what he produced. I have a signed original in my basement now of this. It's just, uh, to me, it's a very special structure. Um, and so uh, I don't know if that answers the question. I just told you what my favorite result ever was. But you know, every structure and every, uh, insight gained from those structures has been incredibly special to me. The excitement has never gone away, even after 30 years of seeing these things for the first time. That's great, thank you. Um, let's see, I don't see any other questions. We can wait just a minute to see if something comes through here. Absolutely. Um, okay, here's one. If you had just a few minutes to tell a patient at SCCA why structural biology is important for cancer treatment, what would you tell them? Absolutely, that's an easy one for me. Um, so at the SECA, of course, people are uh, generally being treated with some form now of uh, uh, transplants and uh, cancer immunotherapy. Those are sort of the standards of care that the Hutcher really specializes in. Um, and cancer immunotherapy right now is in the very early days of being developed. Um, you can expect within the next five to 10 years, the cancer immunotherapy is going to be much, much more effective than it currently is. And that's going to be arrived at by making much better um, cellular therapies, uh, uh, which involves uh, 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 using a wide variety of uh, protein-based tools to engineer those cells, those CAR T cells, uh, to genetically uh, alter them with, and provide them with instructions for atta attacking cancers. Um, and uh, so engineered proteins figure prominently into the development of cancer immunotherapy. And in order to engineer those proteins, you need structures of those proteins. So my lab is actually involved now. One of our main projects is developing tools uh, for improving uh, uh, T cell culture and T cell uh, manufacture for cancer immunotherapy. And that's all uh, the information that allows us to do that. It all stems from solving structures. So there is a direct translational connection between solving certain types of structures and developing actual uh, 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 therapeutic tools and drugs and treatments for, for cancer. And, there, and it's, it's not a, a distant uh, connection, it's a very immediate connection. We are actually collaborating directly uh, with clinician, clinical scientists and companies here in the area that are working hard to develop better cancer immunotherapy tools. Great, thank you. Um, next question, are there areas where X-ray crystallography will still be the predominant method over cryo-EM? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, the short answer is I certainly hope so, because uh, uh, I love X-ray crystallography. Um, so cryo-EM, uh, uh, it turns out the bigger the protein, the better it is, as one might imagine, right? You're taking a picture directly. So 
it's easier to take a picture uh, uh, with an electron microscope of something really big. Uh, so crystallography is still the, uh, 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 the, the uh, method of choice for uh, smaller proteins. And many, and many proteins that are smaller are still extraordinarily important for uh, research, for drug development, for uh, biology. Um, so there's a gap which crystallography, so crystallography basically runs right up to a certain size limit and then cryo-EM takes over. Conversely, cryo-EM is good down to a certain size point and then crystallography takes over. But I will say cryo-EM is getting more and more powerful and then sort of extending its reach to smaller and smaller things. So it may be, I would say in another 10 years, it may be that crystallography is, is just no longer the, uh, a broadly used technique at all for structural studies. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if cryo-EM just completely takes over, but we're not there yet and we won't be for a few years yet. Okay, thanks. Um, what is the state of our understanding protein folding? Will AI, uh, slash, will AI slash machine learning help? That's another great question. Um, so as many of you realize, uh, computational tools and in particular uh, artificial intelligence machine learning approaches, for example, uh, and in particular as Google has uh, advanced, have become increasingly uh, uh, accurate at predicting the structure of a protein using nothing more than its amino acid sequence um, to the point where some of those predictions uh, are of, of a quality and an accuracy that basically rival the actual thing, the actual determined structure. That's great for uh, visualizing a single protein by itself, but biology doesn't happen uh, as a result of single proteins. Uh, uh, most biology happens by proteins interacting with one another and binding to one another and forming much larger multi-protein machines and assemblages. And uh, the ability to uh, predict the fold of individual proteins doesn't give you any information about how those proteins come together to form large complex machines. Think back to the spliceosome where that has 37 proteins and four RNAs in it. Um, computers might be able to predict the, the, the folds and the structures of the individual pieces, but it would do nothing for you in terms of how they come together to make a spliceosome. So, there's an enormous gap between fold pr uh, prediction of the structures of individual proteins and actually visualizing biological machines doing their job in a cell. So there's, uh, I, I don't see that gap being closed by computational approaches uh, anytime in my lifetime or beyond. Great. Um, how similar is the X-ray crystallography practiced today to what, Ros what Rosalind Franklin used in her DNA images? Wow, that's a great picture. That's a great uh, question uh, as well. Um, it's much different, uh, simply by virtue of the fact that when Rosalind Franklin was collecting her diffraction images, uh, she didn't have detectors. She was using X-ray film. Uh, they didn't have, basically, they did not have computers. Uh, all the computations were carried out uh, was on, by hand. Um, uh, uh, to me, one of the most amazing technological achievements uh, in the history of science are the very, very first protein structures that were solved by crystallography using uh, uh, very primitive tools for computation and for data collection. Um, um, so there's, there's really no comparison. Nowadays, we put a crystal on a machine and basically more, more often than not, the structure just kind of spills out computationally with very few steps uh, uh, of manual intervention. Um, so it, it, the bo bottom line is it's incredibly easy compared to what uh, the, the original practitioners uh, uh, did. And the name that you should all know, uh, obviously Rosalind Franklin is one, but uh, uh, go to the Wikipedia page and read about my hero, which is Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin. Uh, Dorothy Hodgkin or Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin was an amazing leader in this field going back to the 1920s. And uh, I, I had the pleasure of meeting her once near the end of her life. And, uh, I was sort of tongue-tied. I, I went all sort of science fanboy on her because she's just such a, was such an amazing scientist. 